I've started recording and I'll start my video so that you can you can see what it looks like on a on a cloudy day in New York. Um, two things before we start. One is of course the fact that we are part of the Linux Foundation and hence uh, we need to abide by the antitrust policy. The other is about treating each other with the respect, even when we happen to disagree with something somebody says, we can always debate and talk about stuff rather than call each other names. So with that, I'm going to start uh, this presentation. I'm going to share my screen. You got to tell me whether you can see it or not. And uh, that is my screen. Yes. Um, yes, we I'm do. I'm going to go into slideshow. So this is meant to be a discussion in that, in the sense that uh, you are welcome to ask questions and to participate and to comment. Uh, so I wanna talk about uh, the themes that we are gonna talk about today, which is one is um, about Minsky himself, Hyman Minsky contributions and uh, some of the uh, things about Minsky moment and some timeline of the FTX collapse and the contagion and hopefully the remedy or the antidote, uh, which is still uh, being formulated. So what is Minsky's con contributions? He reinterpreted uh, Keynes for the modern age, uh, well, not really the modern age because he died in uh, somewhere in the 80s or 90s. I, I don't know exactly when. Um, but the main view was against classical market view, which is basically consists of two things that uh, uh, Walrus, uh, proposed, which is that the participants are infinitely selfish and infinitely farsighted. But Poincaré objected to this right in the beginning. He said that I can allow you infinite selfishness, which is maximization of utility, but not infinitely farsighted, which is the crux of all the financial crashes that we have seen so far. That means people forget and people project into the future, the present and see a rosy picture, but really speaking, there are problems always bubbling under the surface. So, the classical view of markets is that the markets are efficient and the economy is an equilibrium seeking and self-sustaining system. But Minsky says, this is not true. He was ignored um, for a long time, but then came into prominence uh, during the 2007, 2008 crisis because his words um, were proved sort of prescient, but it's not prescient. He's, he's a student of history and of human behavior in a certain sense. And that's why uh, he's accurate, not uh, because he's a prophet and can see into the future. We are all prophets. We can see into the future because 
we use common sense to a certain degree and we do not attribute to ourselves infinite farsightedness. We do not say I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I am a uh, financial uh, sector maximalist. I'm a bond maximalist, anything of that sort. We act with a view to the past, but knowing that the future is unknown. So that is the main takeaway from Minsky, but I can go a little deeper into what he actually said. So there's empirical evidence. Uh, I mean, obviously uh, we, I'm starting in 1873, but the empirical evidence stretches far behind, before all, all of this. There were many crises and uh, there is the crisis of 1873, 1893, panic of 1907. Of course, everybody knows about the Great Depression. Uh, then 1966. So there is a long period between 30 and 66. So everybody thought, oh, now the era of financial crisis is over because we have had 20 or 30 years of uh, stability. But obviously, for those who forget history, uh, financial crisis is never, you know, can never be said to be handled properly. So, you know, he goes through empirical evidence saying that, okay, these are all the different crises. Now, we have heard of bank runs. The one on the left is the familiar figure which has uh, happened in the United States with uh, depressing uh, regularity. But on the right is what happened in Lebanon, for example, you know, which is just a year old. And there have been runs even in 2022 and uh, 20, uh, 2022, especially with respect to Russian banks, Sber Bank in Czechoslovakia, uh, other uh, instances. So the runs are with us and uh, we will see what is, you know, obviously everybody kind of knows what a bank run is, which is basically all the depositors clamoring to get their deposits back at the same time or in a short period of time since bank uh, reserves uh, are not 100%, that can cause uh, tremendous problems. But in the case of the United States, bank crunches are not that common. Uh, the main reason may be the provision of the FDIC insurance and people are getting used to the fact that FDIC will back uh, a regulated bank uh, um, you know, up to a, I think it is 150,000 and 250 for a joint account. Uh, so most people do not have more than that in a regular bank account. So they are uh, pretty much complacent, even if they hear that the banks are in trouble, they're not all going to rush to the bank, either physically or virtually to look at, uh, to, you know, withdraw their funds. The thing that happened with FTX is of course, uh, characterized as a bank run, even though uh, FTX was not a bank, but it's basically a uh, customers who had short-term demand deposits of some sort, like immediate deposit, not locked up, deposits like a money market or, or a, uh, you know, term deposit, all running to the bank and all running to FTX to withdraw their money. So the 
main contribution that uh, Minsky uh, made, which is even today uh, irrelevant even today, um, is says that uh, that he is looking at an economy as a capital a capitalistic economy a capitalist economy with expensive capital assets and a complex sophisticated financial system moving through time. Moving through time is important because today everything looks good, but what about tomorrow and the day after tomorrow? Uh, that's what we have to be concerned about. And so the normal investor action is where the present money is exchanged for future money. Future money in the sense it is uh, a debt to be paid back in the future with interest, or it is an investment in something that will yield future returns. So in both cases, it's looking at the future to uh, come up with a uh, you know, with a case for investing today. And it's supposed to be uh, enthusiasts versus skeptics. In this uh, context, Minsky couched that the enthusiasts are the businessmen who are trying to do something productive and the skeptics are the bankers. But it's not just the bankers. Bank does not mean bank. It means anybody who finances or deposits or in any way participates in the financial life of the country. That includes households, uh, governments, uh, international institutions, and other ins institutions who may um, function as um, people providing credit. So enthusiasts versus skeptics. Um, this is the background, okay, all this stuff. So what does he say? He says that every day we face a survival or a reserve constraint. It's a balance sheet uh, operation. That means, are we bringing in enough money to pay our obligations, either our interests or provision for future payouts? So he uh, divides the types of economic units into three. One is called a hedge. Uh, I mean, it's, it might seem similar to hedge fund, but they can fulfill all of the, uh, their contractual payment obligations by their cash flows. Uh, speculative can meet their payment commitments to interest, but not principal. Ponzi cannot pay their interest, not principal from cash flows. So how do they exist? By bringing in more, um, people investing in them, and they are able to pay the interest by that means. And that is the normal definition of a Ponzi scheme. But this has nothing to do with the Ponzi scheme. It is uh, analysis of economic units in the uh, existing economy divided into three by their ability to make uh, to meet their uh, payment commitments uh, today, today only today. That means, can they pay their interests? Can they pay? Can they have provisions to pay everything? So on the one edge we have hedge, and the other edge we have Ponzi. So there is a spectrum. It goes from hedge to Ponzi. The first theorem is the economy as financial regimes under which it's stable and financing, financing regimes under which it's unstable. Over periods, the second theorem, over periods of prolonged prosperity, 
The economy transits from financial relations that make for a stable system to financial relations that make for an unstable system. In other words, a movement from hedge to Ponzi. This is a characteristic of capitalist systems, according to him, and the instability is baked in uh, because it's based on sentiment. And furthermore, the containment measures, like for example, the uh, central bank raising interest rates during uh, the times of prosperity and the uh, increase in Ponzi schemes will cause more units to move towards the Ponzi end and the collapse of the formerly Ponzi units. In, in other words, the speculate, speculative uh, uh, economic units will move towards a Ponzi unit when the central bank tightens. Uh, and when the central bank um, loosens economic policy, I mean, this is just one way of looking at it, right? It, it also talks about the sentiment in the marketplace. So um, there is a definition uh, of a Minsky moment is a sudden major collapse of asset values, which mark the end of the uh, growth phase of a cycle in credit markets or business activity. Uh, Minsky moment is sort of an invention. It is a catchy phrase, but Minsky never used it. Uh, it is probably a Minsky cycle. In other words, it is not just a sudden moment where all this stuff happens. Although many people have tried to uh, put their finger on exactly when, um, you know, financial crisis happens. In our in our case, in the uh, in the so so to back up a little bit, the two phrases that I use, cryptos Minsky moment. Uh, I mean, the two, you know, uh, yeah, two phrases that I can say. Cryptos, you know, you, you can't talk about crypto uh, really because the cryptographers often object. And uh, Minsky moment, as we know, does not exist. It is more of a Minsky cycle. So both the uh, phrases used in, uh, he in the heading of this presentation are wrong. That's kind of an uh, interesting observation, but that's what's happening. So according to Minsky, it's like breathing. The economy goes from a disciplined approach where the money supply goes down or money is uh, tight to where the money is loose and it expands. So it is almost like uh, the breathing of a giant beast that, that might be, you know, uh, it's, it's a natural phenomenon, in other words. So we go from discipline to elasticity and back, uh, almost like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a part of the business or the money, money cycle. Um, so we bring this knowledge to what happened with FTX and Alameda. Of course, the nexus between FTX and Alameda was not really evident. Uh, the extent of the link was not really evident until the whole thing fell apart. But in the course of one week, we have seen that, uh, you know, about nine days, November 2nd, the Coindesk article came out 
uh, saying that the major assets of Alameda is in FTT. And the second was when Binance chief tweeted that he was going to sell about 530 million worth of FTT, which is not supposed to happen in a true crypto economic uh, analysis because it is against his uh, immediate self uh, interest in the sense that if the price of FTD falls, that amount 530 or 580 million dollars would um, go down rapidly. So no whale in their right mind is supposed to be doing this kind of stuff, but he did it because there were other considerations. First, $530 million is nothing for him. Second, uh, he wanted to um, take revenge on his uh, on SBF. So now you, you have this uh, phenomenon uh, where you know the sale has happened. And then of course the Binance drama. Elizabeth has posted that is the intersection uh, in her uh, of the two lines. We can talk about that in a minute. Offer uh, to buy and then withdraw and then bankruptcy filing. But what does this have to do with Minsky? I mean, okay, my thesis is that when EC money and lots of money sloshing around happens, people uh, are no longer disciplined, including big corporations like So big corporations like Sequoia Capital, uh, I mean, big, you know, VCs, Sequoia Capital, uh, SoftBank, Temasek, all of these guys had hundreds of millions of dollars invested in FTX. FTX itself was probably playing around with, the, with that money. Uh, it's not just fraud, but obviously, uh, the Alameda uh, research group had lots of different investments and lots of different assets that were rapidly falling in price. If you recall, before November 2nd, much before November 2nd, there was a collapse of Terra Luna, plus there was the feeling that uh, you know, EC money had come to a halt. So the assets that they were holding were rapidly falling in value. And obviously when that happens, they do all kinds of stupid things. Like for example, uh, use other people's money, uh, which is basically the, uh, the funds and exchanges to try to prop up the value of the rest of the stuff. And this is a Minskyan, um, it, it fits in with the Minskyan analysis, which is, you know, how do you, how do you get supposedly sophisticated people not doing their due diligence and investing huge amounts of money in a uh, operation that is shaky to start with. It's already um, got problems with respect to the price of crypto assets. Uh, 
of Bitcoin, of Ethereum, everything fell uh, by huge amounts in the beginning of the year. Uh, and of course, exacerbated by the um, Terra Luna collapse and you know many other firms in which FTX had uh, investments like Three Arrow Capital, some of the other uh, organizations, uh, economic units, as Minsky calls them, uh, were uh, cratering. And um, of course, uh, FTX and SBF uh, appeared to be a hero by riding to their rescue, but it was completely in their own self-interest because I think there was a tangled uh, web of um, obligations and liabilities that would have come to light if they had really crashed. And of course, uh, the aftermath of November 11th, uh, we have seen other big corporations under pressure that is, uh, you know, BlockFi, Genesis, Gemini uh, Exchange, and so on. So uh, when this happens, it's a, it's, it's, it's not, you know, there is contagion, of course, uh, in the crypto world. And everybody in the regular centralized finance world is happily sitting there thinking there is no linkages between crypto and uh, centralized finance. But we have seen collapses that are even more spectacular in the centralized uh, uh, finance and traditional financial world, which is what Minsky was talking about. He, he knew nothing about crypto. Uh, and, but the same analysis can be applied to this. So what of all these analysis? What is the point? Uh, what can we do? I mean, is there, is there something that can be done in order to, um, to lessen the impact or to prevent such spectacular collapses? Um, And Minsky had some uh, prescriptions for this. You know, I don't know. Okay, so going back to the FTX and Alameda, the Minsky cycle, uh, I had already mentioned most of this. Uh, basically, it is a um, round trip from elasticity to discipline. Um, and uh, the Minsky cycle will come uh, from elasticity going into dis uh, discipline, which is through regulation and other ways in which the uh, system can uh, can be sort of counter cyclically uh, handled by the way you know any one of you guys can ask some questions or um, or interject uh, maybe this is a good time for elizabeth to talk about uh, the uh, Minsky moment in her uh, estimation of the uh, of the green cycle. Um, I think she is. Uh, oh, thanks. Sure. So uh, I was trying to point, point, find the Minsky moment in every kind of cryptocurrency I can think of, and I'm of course working with carbon currency. And I thought, well, one day nobody's going to want to buy carbon credits because we will have solved the entire atmospheric problem and we'll no longer be emitting carbon um, at a, a rate faster than we're sequestering it. So I looked at these two charts and tried to figure out, okay, there's going to be a time when uh, the carbon credit will be valueless just simply because 
you know, no one's emitting carbon anymore. They're, everybody's net zero, everybody's climate neutral. And so I looked on these two charts on this webpage that I put into the chat, the link. And I, I thought, I has, uh, my question is, is, is this sort of what, what you mean by misty moment? Well, not, not exactly, but um, it is more of a macroeconomic situation in the sense that money is um, free, you know, money is very loose. So people would uh, put their money into all kinds of projects, in, including uh, things that are highly speculative. And uh, what that causes is uh, rapid inflation or increase in asset values. And then the government steps in or somebody steps in uh, to rein it back or you get caught out with by people saying, oh, you know, you don't need, have enough assets to take care of your liabilities properly, you're a Ponzi. At that point, it, it becomes a uh, feedback loop and then the collapse happens. And then according to Minsky, the Ponzi, uh, the ones that are pure Ponzi at the beginning of the site, uh, at the end of the elasticity cycle will disappear, will be bankrupt. The ones who are speculative will move into the Ponzi area. And uh, maybe some of the hedge uh, assets will um, move into the speculative area. But when the tightening happens, uh, then with, during discipline periods, then um, the other, the, uh, the economic units become, you know, more disciplined, more of the hedge uh, economic units appear and so on and so forth. But his main thesis is that some of these, uh, uh, some, sometimes these cycles are, create some kind of a destructive, um, you know, like a negative feedback loop. That's mainly through the use of leverage because when uh, monetary policy becomes um, very loose, that will happen. Anyway, Mark, uh, you have something to say? No, I was just thinking about, I mean, how distributed ledger technology offers, it, if properly designed, the ability to maybe counteract Minsky. This, I think the lesson I, I was taking in looking at this wasn't just, you know, the, the, the Minsky component, but it was, the Minsky component by the imperfect information, but in you know, in DLT, I have the opportunity for really much improved transparency um, uh, and all the sort of uh, risks aggregated into a sort of one visible visible place if designed that way. I mean, because here, you know, there was also this back door that was sort of not known or not disclosed not seen in, in, in a transparent manner that allowed for these funds to go to, to Alameda, that allowed for this accounting to create the uh, illusion that fueled the Ponzi. So I was just sort of thinking about how this technology in this case, both fostered uh, a perfect Minsky moment, but also in thinking around what lessons learned and in, in designing for better architecture, um, we could also think around how we could have uh, mechanisms in place for better transparency across the uh, the stakeholders to a consortium blockchain. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the point is Minsky is um, not a you know not saying that something like he doesn't say that Ponzi is bad. For example, he he says that that's what happens because people drop their uh, uh, they are less guarded when there is a lot of money sloshing around. And that operates in every uh, uh, economic situation. Uh, but on the other hand, he also talks about the destructive nature 
of these uh, deleveraging spirals. Uh, and further, he uh, proposes certain ways uh, to uh, counter the extreme swings. I mean, you know, he re recognizes that there is swings. So Minsky is not all negative. He's also talking about how to counteract, counteract uh, these phenomena, how to reduce the resonant effects. In other words, instead of just destroying the entire financial system, like almost happened in, in, during the Great Depression, uh, these days it's not happening so much because of some of these things. And what you're saying is uh, correct. That is probably one of the ways in which these swings can be um, tamed, right? And which we are going to go into in a slightly different, you know, so there are these antidotes that he has uh, proposed and I can go and look more at exactly what he means by these, you know, like for example, we can prevent and contain instability. That is what you are talking about, probably by using a proof of reserves or some such technique to ensure uh, and increase trust in the organization and, and uh, keeping the economic unit uh, sort of honest that they do not go into this, uh, you know, like doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, this is this has happened in regular finance, right? I mean, if I am speculating on the price of silver or something, uh, and the price of silver starts falling, I, I'm betting that it's going to go up. Uh, and then it starts to fall, what do I do? I, you know, I kind of borrow money and buy more silvers to keep the price up. Uh, and somebody is willing to, to lend me that money. And that causes bigger and bigger problems because you're basically uh, trying to stop a falling knife. Uh, unless it is a big organization, like, you know, for example, we had the guilt crisis that's also caused by leverage in the um, British uh, guilts, you know, which are the sovereign bonds issued by, uh, by um, the English people, uh, I mean, by the UK uh, government. Um, and that had a kind of a, the, the, the price fell and that caused more selling, which in, in, in turn increased, uh, I mean, decreased the price even further and so on. But it is only uh, when somebody with a big bazooka steps up like the Bank of England uh, and starts buying gilts that the price stabilized. But even then it did not really stabilize until the government that caused that crisis of confidence left. So uh, I suppose you're talking about uh, proof of reserve uh, as one of the techniques that can be used. Um, so here the antidotes are two, which is one is prevent and contain instability. And the other is pick up the pieces and fix financial structure after the crash, which is what happened in 2007, 2008, um, when uh, Fed intervened, and then of course had lots of different programs to do all kinds of things with respect to being the lender or the dealer of last resort. Unfortunately, we do not have a comparable structure in the crypto markets. We do not have FDIC insurance. We do not have a dealer of last resort providing liquidity. Uh, we can do certain things like uh, you just mentioned, which is 
I suppose you're talking about proof of reserve. Um, but even that, you know, there have been, uh, in the actual implementation of that, uh, there have been problems. Uh, I don't know whether you want to comment further on that, uh, Mark. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, it was, you know, it was thinking around proof of reserve, but of course, the, the underlying reserve, the, the, the value, the sentiment could always could always fall. Again, it gets a bit into the accounting mechanisms, but also in the modeling, these sort of stress testing that you see, so that at least the consumer has some awareness as to, or a bit, um, is better informed as to what they're exactly getting into, if that is a, a risky asset or, or a risky market, um, that that is sort of known at its onset instead of uh, in this case, where I think people felt they were entering, a, you know, they were putting money in storage at a centralized exchange and found that there was, you know, absconding of funds to other uh, that then led to the the collapse of the of the underlying uh, tokens and of course related tokens because there was the interconnectedness was also not seen to the consumer. So it was just sort of thinking about how we can bolster that, but it wouldn't fully uh, diminish all all risks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. It can, there can only be some kind of a counter cyclical force that prevents the like this particular, um, uh, you know, this cycle where the money expands. It, you know, there has to be a countervailing force that acts when the uh, amount of money increases so rapidly and so huge that there has to be something that brings it back to normal in an orderly fashion. Uh, the problem is when it's not orderly, it can cause collapse of the entire system. Um, and that's what, uh, you know, central banks and other, um, other uh, institutions have been trying to do. But in, F in uh, crypto, cryptocurrencies or crypto assets, no such comparable mechanism exists uh, for intervening uh, after the fact and no comparable institution of uh, insurance exists. Uh, but I think uh, there is some talk about that going on. Um, yeah, that's what I'm trying to provide. I put it in the chat about it. So so if we were to qualify all of the carbon creditors as being lifetime climate neutral, and then they, they also have sequestered carbon that turns them into creditors instead of debtors, because most people are carbon debtors, then what we would do is we would be saying that um, no Ponzi's are allowed in the carbon credit game right now. Uh, practically everyone who's selling carbon, so-called carbon credits, carbon tokens are, are Ponzi schemes. They, you know, they're lifetime emitters. And then they, all of a sudden they decide they're going to plant a tree and that would, and then sell that <laughs> as if uh, they're actually they haven't they haven't even offset their own emissions yet. So I'm trying to put together a a node requirements that node operators are all clim climate, uh, they have climate credit, they have carbon credit there. They're carbon neutral and they have credit in, in uh, what's it called proof of stake, of carbon credit, proof of authority, proof of uh, proof of reserve, like you said. So that would be pre pretty much be the same thing as proof of stake if they have enough reserve that they could actually cover if somebody were to say, well, uh, you know, no, I, I want to, uh, sell you back my carbon credit because I have become carbon neutral and so I don't need to offset my emissions anymore. Here's your carbon credit back. And then they'd actually be able to, um, I don't know, how would that work? Yeah, I mean, this, uh, you know, like I said before, this is a generic macroeconomic uh, uh, sort of you know, a, a theory or concept, but it's also based on empirical evidence. And uh, they trot out Minsky only when there is some uh, problem. 
like 2007, 2008, or some, some, some failures happening, and so on. So even in carbon credits, you know, the problem is a measurement problem, right? I mean, in the end, uh, it's like a reserve problem. That means, how can I say, where are the standards to say that I've actually either sequestered carbon of certain amount, or I have uh, created a carbon sink uh, that will last, you know, I don't know how many years, but in the case of trees, we know that um, all the fossil fuel we are burning is really carbon locked up in the ground over millions of years. In fact, probably two or three billion years. So we are consuming that, uh, that uh, reserve that is in the ground uh, and uh, releasing the carbon to the atmosphere. So, you know, it's very clear that even the, you know, in, in the end, it's a measurement problem, just like the reserves for uh, FTX or any other organization. And there are, you know, so in the case of reserves, we have this very simple diagram, uh, which is basically assets minus liabilities is the, is equal to the proof of solvency. So how do you prove the assets? How do you prove the liabilities? So it becomes uh, an exercise in creating some kind of a Oracle. I mean, Chainlink has this uh, proof of reserve, but I, I didn't want to put that up here because that's not the only way to deal with it. But, and plus it may have problems of its own. How do you prove the assets? You, you know, the, one of the methods is by uh, saying that I'm going to uh, look at all the assets that I have um, in a bank and uh, basically uh, put it on some kind of a Merkle tree and all the liabilities that I have in terms of the customer accounts and then aggregate you know, show that one is greater than the other. Assets should be greater than or equal to the liability. Otherwise, um, you're, uh, you're going to have problems. But in the case of regular banks, which generate credit in the market, assets will never be equal to liabilities because they are only required to keep a certain percentage locked up in reserves uh, and you know they they generate money at scale obviously they are protected through the use of fdic insurance so i'm wondering is there is there a way to create an insurance um, for you know something similar to fdic insurance for um, uh, crypto assets. Um, well, clearly every every token would have to be asset backed. Well, I yeah. mean, uh, backed on the asset that's backing the the currency is something more than just the hype. Yeah, but then the pure cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and uh, and Ethereum do not have anything that is backing them. In fact. All these ecosystems like Ethereum is, is based on, in the beginning on some kind of a, a utility token um, to pay for gas or whatever for the world computer. <laughs> and then uh, now of course it is exploded into this hundreds, thousands, 20,000 tokens that are not backed by anything. So uh, I don't know how we can apply these, these principles to, uh, you know, to crypto assets or cryptocurrencies or whatever you want to call them. Um, FDIC insurance stuff has been 
Um, yeah, I mean, there is, Alfonso has asked, is there a way to measure speculation causing instability? Um, usually it is through um, a measure of the speed at which prices of stuff of tokens increase uh, without any uh, sort of underlying cause. But, you know, when tokens are generated with no backing assets, then we have a problem. The other, you know, some of the other uh, ways in which you can look at uh, this is through uh, um, measuring uh, depth of market, for example, uh, you know, to measure liquidity, but these are instantaneous measures. Um, I don't know whether there can be other ways. Does anybody else have any opinion about any of this stuff or am I, you know, so the, so the two things that, um, that we seem to need are, one is an insurance scheme. Uh, and there was such a talk in uh, Balancer protocol to create an insurance scheme uh, using um, the proceeds that are thrown up from the activity in the DeFi. The other is, but even that, you know, how much depth can it have uh, in terms of whether they will have infinite, uh, you know, like uh, FDIC insurance, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty guaranteed. Uh, and the other thing to note is that it, it doesn't get used that often. It is more of a sentiment play, meaning um, FDIC, the fact that there is an FDIC insurance reassures people and they don't just run to the bank a, a, every time there is a problem, to try to withdraw all their money. Uh, so it, it serves the purpose uh, by not being used that much. The other one is the dealer of last resort or uh, liquidity providers who have deep uh, who have deep pockets uh, or infinite in, in the case of central banks, uh, you know, endogenous money. Uh, they have incredible amounts of liquidity, which cannot be measured by ordinary people because they can just print money at will. Um, normally they don't. I mean, you know, most of the money in this economy is generated by commercial banks. In the, so how can, how can those kind of structures be replicated in, um, or, or should we only be thinking of those kind of structures? Are there new ways in which we can um, uh, tamp down this volatility, uh, you know, boom and the bus cycles? I think that we should have an Oracle connecting Python code that uh, searches all through all the databases, including the banks, to find out what kind of assets a person really does have before their token is considered asset backed. And then it, it logs all the changes on the blockchain so that everybody knows um, when, when a, um, somebody who owns tokens uh, suddenly becomes insolvent and then therefore they can go ahead and do their run on the money then before uh, it becomes a big problem. Yeah, I mean, that is definitely the way the proof of reserves work uh, with especially the ones that are proposed by Chainlink. Um, I don't know how frequently one, I, one runs those 
things or is it a constant monitoring? Uh, I've seen yeah, all constant. kinds. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen all kinds of, uh, um, you know, objections. I've seen all kinds of, like the stablecoin guys, for example, they publish uh, audit every month, which is kind of useless because in one month, the amount of stable coins issued or, or um, burnt could be huge in proportion to the size of the stable coin. But nonetheless, this seems to reassure people for some reason. But you're, you're talking about the proof of reserve, uh, Elizabeth, uh, that have been proposed um, by outfits like Chainlink. Um, yeah, uh, that is definitely there. Uh, Marcus said that um, Yeah, uh, Marcus said that there is a, a Chicago plan revisited, uh, which is basically like a narrow bank sort of situation for the uh, stable coins, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> well, here, I mean, it was proposing it for, uh, you know, uh, fully capitalized uh, banking structure so that you just like you said the most money is made by commercial banks in our current economy uh, you could imagine you could apply this to sort of the the world of a world of crypto as well and sort of making sure that those are stable coins are are fully backed um and it it also does make sure that the, the lending is uh, is against uh the assets uh, of of that institution so they sort of become sort of service uh, banks become more uh, servicers uh, of of policies for for lending, as the lending is ultimately fully capitalized and not fractional uh, reserve lending. I think that is completely unworkable, at least in the current economy, uh, because if you look at the balance sheets, if you look at the money supply uh, in at the Fed, you will see that. The balance sheet, or you know, the money generated by the commercial banks are in the order of four times or five times, something like twenty trillion dollars uh, compared to what the Fed has. It's like with the reserves and everything else in in the range of five to ten. So to be then saying that you cannot generate more money than reserves becomes a problem, right? Uh, that means there won't be any uh, credit in the market. And why is, how is that controlled? By uh, constant monitoring, like the Fed, uh, the Fed and the OCC and all these organizations um, audit the banks at regular intervals. And the threat is that they will pull your banking license if you're, if you're behaving like, you know, FTX behaved, for example. But these are all centralized uh, structures. So how do you deal with decentralized structures? This is, this is the problem. Anyway, we have come to the end of, uh, of this call, but I would be, I mean, and, and the last comment by Alfonso that, that if you are a saver, um, that you never sell, you're hodling, um, then it becomes an option to reduce speculation because you're never going to sell, never going to buy. Um, maybe you'll buy more, but you never sell, uh, which means the price will keep steady. In any case, um, it's been a 
delightful hour, uh, although we didn't have too many attendees, but we have people who are very involved in this conversation. And thanks to everyone. And we will uh, uh, publish this, uh, you know, this uh, recording for what it's worth. Um, we're looking at different ways to reduce the risk. And if hopefully there's ways to do. Um, thank you. And I think I'm going to end the call, um, stop the share is always. Uh, thank you, Vipin. All bye -bye. right, then we'll, we'll talk in the new year, I guess. Sure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you.